Hello, and thank you so much for joining me for this week's episode of U.S. Dronecast. Our guest this week is Chris Tangi. He's a DP, aerial cinematographer, and location scout down in Australia. He's worked with some of the best directors in Hollywood. He'll share with us some insights and techniques that he has developed, especially to film wildlife, like he's capable of getting really, really close to wildlife. And that has helped him lend some serious work with National Geographic and other world-famous nature series. We'll talk to him about his new film, Firehawk, where he filmed a unique kind of birds down in Australia that have developed this technique around wildfire. Chris has won many international awards for some of his previous work, like Outback, including the 2021 AZ Drone Fest Best Landscape Award. But talking about AZ Drone Fest, our International Drone Film Festival is now open for submission. This is your opportunity to enter your work into one of the many categories that we have and be recognized on an international level. So head over to our website at azdronefest.com for all the information. But enough talking. Let's jump right in with our guest, Chris Tangi. Welcome to U.S. Dronecast, a podcast dedicated to drones, aerial cinematography, safety, commercial, and recreation. So get ready for engaging discussions, insightful interviews, and expert insights from top-notch professionals in the drone industry. Subscribe now and follow us on social. Hey, Chris, thank you so much for joining us all the way down from Australia. I really appreciate you taking the time. Talk to us a little bit about where you live, because I know it's a little bit unique. Uh, thanks, Chris. Yeah, um, our area of Australia is called called the Northern Territory, and uh, it's it's a big place. It's around about, I think, four and a half times the size of Arizona, but we only have a quarter of a million people. So as you can imagine, um, there's a lot of nothingness uh, in the middle, we have sort of deserts below, and then up the top, uh, what we literally call the top end. Uh, that's where the jungles and and crocs and all that sort of stuff are. And in fact, that's where they shot Crocodile Dundee uh, all those years ago. Yeah. So, uh, were you born there, or how did you end up living there? No, I um, I don't know if you've heard of a sea change. Well, I, I had a sand change. I decided to. I was actually in radio for ten years and got pretty sick and tired of the, the ratings game and all of that sort of thing. And I just packed up all of my belongings and um, drove up here, not even ever having been here. And we're, we're like a thousand miles from the nearest city. So Darwin is to our north and Adelaide to our south and then nothing really. There's no way to go east and west anyway. Um, so it was a, an amazing thing for me to do. Um, a crazy thing for me to do, but um, I've never regretted it, not one day in the last uh, couple of decades, yeah. What, what attracted you to the, to the area? Was it just the fact that nobody was around? Um, yeah, a couple of guys I'd known had been here um, years ago working and said, just told me it was a really great place. And, um, yeah, I was on a bit of a downer and just wanted a change of life and, I thought, well, you know, you can't have more of a change of life than coming from Melbourne to uh, a really tiny town of 25,000 people in the middle of nowhere. It's a bit like a Timbuktu kind of place. And uh, as I say, it, it's it's just been absolutely amazing. Every single day uh, is amazing. And um, I, I have never regretted it. Uh, talk to me about your career. So uh, because you had a, a long career in, in, a, in, in a variety of different roles. Uh, yeah, I was born on a farm uh, just outside of Melbourne and then uh, the developers decided to come in and bulldoze it and turn it into a suburb, which also sort of, I guess, uh, pushed me into getting away from cities. Uh, but, uh, yeah, radio, um, I started in, well, actually, uh, I got offered a job out of radio uh, as a television announcer. And um, after two days, they said to me, hey, you're not doing much around here, are you? This is a full-time job and you're just walking up and down the corridor, you know, doing nothing for most of the time, uh, find something else to do. So I literally went and found a cupboard and opened it up and it was full of cameras. And I thought, oh, this looks like fun. So I sort of taught myself camera and then that went into, you know, commercial production news, current affairs, and eventually to location scouting, location management, and um, then uh, cinematography as opposed to, you know, news kind of stuff, and uh, then drone cinematography. But 
I actually bought the original Phantom and I just gave up. I said, oh, forget it, you know. I don't want to have to wire my own gimbal and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I'm not that technical. So I, I actually just gave it away after the first couple of crashes and we always have crashes or prangs as we call them here. And uh, so that was um, that was a, an interesting thing. But then, of course, the Mavic came out, the Mavic 1, and uh, it was so much easier to fly and I could concentrate on my cinematography so I sort of, I might be a bit different to some people. I, I sort of see it as just another tool in the box in a way, uh, how to get a camera into a certain position and how to make a certain move rather than a drone for drone's sake, if you like. Yeah, no, I think it's crucial, right? Like if we are um, uh, cinematographers, it is just another tool. Like, okay, I can pick up a jib, I can pick up a dolly, or I can pick up a drone depending on the type of shots that I want. But I, exactly. I think Drone, drone can be both of those things. Absolutely, right. yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, and and I also don't want you to cut yourself short, but you had a, a really good career in cinemat as a cinematographer. Like you, you worked on some really you know big project with some with some big directors. Yeah, I've, I'm uh, still working in that area, um, which I really enjoy. And uh, yeah, uh, well, Werner Herzog, he was he was the most interesting for sure. No uh, I think if, if people haven't heard of Werner Herzog, um, you can almost forget about his filmmaking career and just look up on Google the 10 craziest things about Werner Herzog, <laughs> <laughs> including get, getting shot during an interview in the Hollywood Hills. Um, he, um, another time he hypnotised his entire cast in a feature film. Uh, he found, uh, I can never say the guy's name, uh, is it Wacom Phoenix? Wacom Phoenix? Yeah, Joachim Phoenix, yeah. He, yeah, he followed him through the Hollywood Hills once and actually saw his car go over the edge at night time and uh, race down the hill to help him. And he was upside down and bleeding. And he, um, uh, Werner knocked on the window and said, hey, are you all right? Are you all right? <clears throat> and he apparently said, oh, you're Werner Herzog. <clears throat> so instead of sort of worrying about his injuries. So, yeah, and, and uh, oh, the, the whole Amazon thing where he, he uh he took Mick Jagger out into the Amazon for four years and he got sick of it and got malaria, literally. But anyway, people should have a read up about him. But it, uh, the thing with Werner when he's directing you is his, his most common thing is keep going, just keep going. And I love long shots, so we got on really well because he just wants and, – and to me, uh, and I think he agreed, uh, the most powerful movement a drone can make or the most powerful shot is actually just simply moving forward because that's how our, our minds imagine flying. It, you know, when you're dreaming, that's the way you, you, you fly. Um, so that's, that's um, something to always remember. If, you, if you're getting shots in any particular location, make sure you always get that one as well. Yeah, I, I'm so jealous. I took, um, I took his master class. I don't know if you're familiar with, with his master class, uh, but it was by far the best money I've ever spent on learning um, some of my craft because he's so, he, first, he's unbelievably talented, but he's also such a teacher. And so his masterclass is out of this world. I'm not getting paid. I'm not receiving anything. I'm just saying that like, it was really, really good. So I'm I'm actually well, really he, jealous that you get to work with him. Yeah. Well, he's cerebral. You know, he, he thinks. He thinks out of both sides of the brain all of the time. And uh, he's an absolute gentleman and um, just, yeah, fantastic to work it, it, it's sort of sometimes it's the things he doesn't say rather than what he does say um so he, he understands that for every shot it's just as important as what you leave out as what you have in do you, what are some other things that you picked up from working with uh him or some other um you know big directors out there or or, or, or dps um what are some of the things that influenced you um oh humility Humility, the old school people like uh, Russell Boyd, um, ASC, ACS. I worked with him on a Tourism Australia a global television commercial and um, I was doing the drone for him and he was 77 at that stage. Uh, he left a message on my phone. Uh, this is the message he said, uh, Chris, it's Russ here. I'm the camera operator for next week. Could you give me a call, please? And that, that was it and I'm going... Because I was like, whoa, Russell Boyd, I'm going to work for Russell Boyd. And that's the, the humility these people had. And I think we can all learn a lot from that, you know, 
I, I often see things on drone forums and whatever saying, um, oh, have a look at my wonderful shot of this, which is absolutely majestic and it's the best shot ever taken. I go, okay, maybe that's our decision to decide that. No. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot out there, so it's kind of tricky for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so talk to me about um, your approach, uh, especially in, in using movement, right? Um, what, how, how do you go, like you talked about the, the moving forward with drone, but how do you approach moving the camera? What's kind of your thoughts behind why or, or when you should move that camera? Well, there's probably two two different circumstances. One is when you just have to get the shot. You know, it's, right. it's more like news kind of choice. Um, something's happening in front of you. You just got to get it, grab it. But if you do have the opportunity, and sometimes you can even have it with wildlife, uh, is to rehearse the shot. Um, there's an Australian comedian here who used to say the best ad lib is a rehearsed ad lib. And it, and it kind of is, you know, it, it's um, if you can rehearse that move and be happy with the shot, then then take the shot. Don't just fly around wildly and think in shots. You don't think, you just don't, don't roll and hope that you're going to get something. You've got to think in 10 to 20 second shots generally, unless, unless it, um, as I say, unless it lives longer than that, if the shot deserves a longer run, then do it. And if it, if it deserves 40 seconds, 60 seconds, do it. Because you can never go back. A lot of the time you can never go back to these locations, particularly in that light. So you're better off to just grab it now. And if it fills up more drives, then so what? Uh, but you're much better off to have more than less to a point, you know. Uh, it's always the juggling between um, how much, uh, you know, data or data, however they say it, um, you have on your drives and, and the backup thing, because I, I have to back up twice at least, and one of them is physically elsewhere. I, I keep it out of the building. Um, you know, I, another thing I do, and I'm probably getting off off uh, the uh, track here, but no, another okay. thing I do, I, I often get in, before I uh, dump it onto a drive, I actually trim each clip to where I want it and then um, throw the rest of it out. So that's a, an efficient way to try and um, keep your, your data under control. Yeah. Um, and, and so let's talk a little bit about uh, this this film that you have, Firehawks. Um, first of all, introduce us to Firehawks because I, I saw your film, but I had no idea that they, that those hawks existed and, and, and the particularity of what they do. So talk to me about those particular birds and, and what they like doing. Yeah, well, there's three species of raptor in Australia and they're all kites. <clears throat> and they, excuse me, they all, um, they've been observed by so many people. It's, so it's not, it's not a, an urban myth or whatever, it's, it actually happens, but they, they pick up flaming sticks and fly outwards from the fire and drop them and start other fires because it's in their interest to uh, get a lot of activity going. So what happens is the insects and, and uh, moths and all sorts of things come out of the grass once the fire comes and also lizards and all sorts of stuff come out in the front of the fire. And another unique thing about these birds is that they uh, can uh, feed on the wing. So they'll actually grab something out of midair and throw it straight into their mouth as they're flying. So they can continually feed stuff into their mouths. Um, so it's become a bit of a holy grail for a lot of people and, and for me as well to try and get these guys actually doing what they do. Um, I've even been talking to, you know, basically the, the top natural history people in the world about how a plan to do it. And, um, we're thinking we need at least a long lens, like the 50 to 1,000 Canon, which they use for everything, uh, and have at least one drone in the air, and and preferably with the uh, the longer focal length as well. Yeah. But um, go ahead. Yes, I was going to say that Firehawks. Uh, it was very opportunistic for me, and I it it wasn't all shot on the same day. I I must admit, I I chopped down the cherry tree. Um, it was. Actually, about um, it was just a fire in my own valley uh, where I live, and uh, I knew that it was uncontrolled. There were no fire people there, and I'd heard uh, on a forum locally that the fire brigade knew about it, but said, "Look, you know, we're just going to let it run," which is what they do uh, quite a lot out here. 
Uh, and if it looks like it's going to endanger anyone, then we'll come and do something about it. But otherwise, we'll just let it burn because uh, often fires here are um, uh, helpful to the environment. They actually trigger things to grow and all that kind of thing. Uh, so anyway, uh, I got the drone out. I, I shot uh, the firehawks in action. And then it occurred to me that, you know, it's also um, affecting the rock wallabies and things up above because you could see the fire going up into the thing. So I went back and shot uh, reactions from rock wallabies and so on and uh, what are called euros, which are the mid-size, sort of mid between a kangaroo and a wallaby, uh, and, um, and then cut it together as if it was a, you know, a real threat on the day. But, uh, you know, often natural history people do that anyway. They, they, they don't right. uh, work to a script. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah and I, I was... Just, I just really enjoyed, you know, having a go at it, trying it, you know. Yeah, no, and the, I mean, obviously the the movie is amazing. Like the shots are great, and and the, like you know, you're right. Like the reaction of the wild bees, are, it's unbelievable. Like even how well it looks like you're getting close. So talk to me about your interaction with the wildlife and and kind of how you interact with a drone that could be threatening or loud or whatever. Or how how do you start that process of working with wildlife? Because there's some shots in there too where you're like flying in the middle of birds flying around and it's it's scary like from a drone perspective you're like oh my gosh like this is this is not a safe place for the birds or the drone <laughs> yeah yeah well there's t two things again i think uh one is um i recommend generally if you're approaching wildlife particularly a bird in a tree or an animal on a rock or whatever using at least half your battery in the approach the rest of it you'll get the shot don't worry about it but if you don't do that, you probably won't get the shot anyway. So it's all about really, really, really slowly moving in. And um, also don't do quick quick things with the joystick. Don't, you know, because the revs, it can affect the uh, animal's reaction. So they, they hear the rrr, 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 and, and that's not what you want to do. You want to be literally leaning very, very gently on the joystick as you approach, then stop. And, you know, let them have a look at you and get used to you and all of that. And then you can think about your moves. You might want to do a peel around. You might want to do uh, another slow approach as you're rolling or something like that. Uh, with those particular birds you're talking about, um, they're called corellas. And I actually have had experience with them all over Australia, like geographically the, the equivalent of um, the area of the, the continental United States. So I, I sort of know these birds. And generally, you can't um, categorise a, a specific species uh, to react in any particular way. But these particular birds, called corellas, uh, they're a kind of cockatoo, uh, are fascinated by drones. And I've found this all over Australia. So I knew on that occasion where I came across about 5,000 of them in these dead trees that they were likely to come and have a look at me. So I started uh, a course deliberately towards the sun because I wanted to backlight them, but a gentle curve in. Uh, so, again, very, very slowly. I mean, as slow as the Mavic 3 can go, uh, and then a gentle, gentle curve. So leaning, as I say, on the sticks again. And sure enough, you know, they fluttered off. In fact, I've got a long version I, I can send you privately anyway, uh, or we can put a link up or something of the entire a sequence where I think it's about two minutes long of, of what I was actually doing. And then I came in slowly and it looked like they sort of flew away. The, the big the big section of birds in front of me just went. But in fact, they were coming up behind me and uh, eventually you'll see them join me and they're actually treating me as a, as a fellow bird, if you like, and on the same level um, and uh, not scared at all, really. And my, my thing about birds is that uh, if they're not running into each other, they're not going to run into me. You know, <laughs> they, they know what they're doing. Yeah, no, no doubt. It, it makes for an amazing shot. I mean, that shot was, I, I just thought it was phenomenal. So it looked really, really cool. So uh, I, I guess I'll have to try that of, of slowly creeping in and, and see if we can get there. But uh, yeah, Don't try it with really awesome. Chris. Don't try it with eagles. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. They will take you out and so will buzzards. Um, yeah. But uh, the thing, as I understand it, with the eagles at least, is they have sort of armor plating on their legs. So uh, if they do make a mistake, at least it won't hurt them. And uh, that's the good thing. But um, yeah, I think we all need to just um, 
be really careful and, and gentle with what we do when we're near wildlife. And um, uh, I, as I think I mentioned to you once before, um, I don't think FPV necessarily uh, and wildlife are a good combo. Um, I think it's it's all about being gentle. Yeah, is that um, have you have you played around with with that type of flying, or do you stick around with just the the cine drones? No, I prefer cine. That's that's all I do really. I mean, I really admire the uh, the FPV people and the way they operate, and it's incredibly impressive. But it's, they're two totally different things, and wow. uh, I think I think that's what some festivals are starting to learn is. Uh, you know, it, you can be uh, extremely clever and all of that kind of thing uh, and fly really well, but it's not necessarily cinematic uh, and vice versa. It's uh, They are two separate things, yeah. Yeah, no, no doubt. So let's go back to the uh, cinematography side of things. What, what kind of advice would you have for uh, people that are trying to break into the industry? Um, our audience is mostly on the aerial cinematography, but I, again, I think it... it at the end of the day, it's cinematography that you, that that people need to learn. But what what kind of advice would you have for people to to help them break into uh, that type of work? Um, I've sort of been blessed in a way because I'm, I'm also a location scout, and so I get to work with crews regardless, and location manager, which is a, a different thing again. Um, but uh, I think really it's um, getting yourself on set somehow. Uh, and and even if it's volunteering, and I know even these days it's it's hard to volunteer because they have insurance stuff and all of that. But really, try and get yourself there, and you start to understand the roles of everybody. You can observe the the camera department, uh, see what they do and how they do it. But um, before even that, get yourself a reel. You know, just shoot everything all the time, uh, and and become an all-rounder know know what audio is all about know what uh, a gaffer is know what um a, a, cl a clapper is you know like a a best boy find out what all these things are but also uh practice your skills and you know these days there's no excuse not to be able to come up with a really really good reel with uh, a, a pretty basic camera or even your phone uh because um you know people around today especially teenagers etc are just uh, absolutely spoiled rotten with um with the availability of really good cameras uh I have, so if, I have four of those spoiled brats <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i'm sure they're good but if you see <laughs> if you see a move that you like then copy it and work out how to do it and there's always more than one way i mean you would know chris um also that if we're away from the big facilities and, and from the big studios and all the rest of it, we have to make do. We have to make a shot work regardless. I mean, I, I remember doing one with some Aboriginal kids on a community out, of, out, of, uh, out in the desert here, and we wanted to do this choir kind of thing with a, a, a lift-up of, um, you know, a jib and all the rest of it, and we had nothing. And so I actually hooked up an old mic stand that they had from the music room, and we put the thing on it. And did this thing, and, I, and it looked fine. It looked great. And this, this is before stabilization. Yeah. But um, yeah, just just think sideways. You know, there's there's other ways to do things. Yeah. Do you? Um, what do you think of the advancement of the technology? Where like those cameras are so good, especially on drones now. Where I don't know if you feel the same way, but sometimes I feel like uh, people don't have a a reason to really learn. You know, exposures and 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 cinematographies and levels. Uh, because they're just pushing a button and it looks great. Um, so I don't know if you feel that way or how do you feel about some of those new cameras coming out? Oh, I think absolutely there are people with that attitude, but it's not a good attitude. Um, in fact, you know, uh, it might be best to go down to a secondhand store and get the worst little uh, VHS camcorder and start shooting on that first. And, and if you can make that look good, then you know that everything beyond that is going to look good. But... Um, yeah, I think uh, you know. I, I've often said you can you can give everyone a Formula One car, but it doesn't mean they can drive it. Um, it's it's a lot. You know, half at least half of everything you do is up here. It's it's thinking and planning and and um, and the other side is the technical, and you really need both uh, to. Um, oh, sorry, I 
it's not quite right because you need the aesthetic as well. You need you need the the, the art, the the creativity as well. But um, you, you really need to just um, uh, be aware of all of these things and, and um, do it your own way, though. But you know, yeah. And in your in your um, expertise and and where you film, like some of those films that we um, that you showed us. Um, I'm I'm guessing you're dealing with like the remoteness is also a, a challenge as far as having the you know all the batteries you need and and not just being able to just go plug something somewhere. So talk to me about the challenges that you may face in in filming in some of those remote areas. Um, yeah, I, I have have two uh, battery hubs for the Mavic Three, and I'll, I'll probably end up with three. Uh, and I have six batteries, and um, I have a combination of. Uh, AC and DC, so I can also be driving along and charging off one of the hubs. Uh, but by far the uh, biggest challenge recently has been how the uh, DJI are suddenly uh, signing us out of the DJI RC Pro in the middle of nowhere. I mean, literally, I, I was up on a really big nature shoot the other day up in the Gulf of Carpentaria with some people I can't even mention because we all have NDAs these days, but on the, on the biggest nature series you can possibly imagine. And I was, I'd gone over creeks and rivers and uh, through termite mound fields and uh, forests and all sorts of stuff to get to this location, to shoot at this location. I tested it before I left. I got there and it said, uh, you need to sign into your um, account. I'm going, what? How am I supposed to sign into my account? I, I'm, 50 kilometers away from uh, the nearest signal. Uh, and, you know, this can cost you real money. This has happened to me three times on big jobs and it's just not acceptable. Like why on earth do you have to sign into an account for your controller to talk to your drone? You know, like, hello, I bought the drone. I bought the controller. It's mine. It should work. Um, you know, I think there's even a, there's even a consumer consumer law thing about um, selling a merchantable item. In other words, what you buy needs to work. Um, right. They can't can't suddenly make it not work. You know, this is this is a really big thing, and I think we need to yeah. pursue it. Did you did you find a work around that, or how did you solve those problems? No, I have to drive back. I literally have to drive back and sign in, and. Uh, you know, all of this will be academic in two or three years when Starlink comes out with a, you know, yeah. mobile yeah. or what. But at the moment, it's a, it's a real, real issue. Yeah, that's crazy. And so, wh where where do you find yourself doing most these days as far as work? Are you are you DPing mostly? Are you flying drone mostly? Are you location scouting, or is it just kind of a mix of all of it? Uh, it's always a mix mix of all because and um and as I say, because of where I am. You have to have several hats and you have to wear them all. And if one area is slow, then the other area is likely to have something happening. Uh, I was just working on a series called Mother Undercover for ABC uh, in the US and uh, Pioneer Productions in London. And um, oh, National Geographic uh, From Above series, um, uh, which is a train series. Um, but a lot of it, yeah, it's, it's not all... Oh, oh, I'm working on a 12K project too for an art gallery. So this is... Uh, yeah. 50 foot long screen, 10 foot high curved uh, and uh, shooting in 12K. And man, that has been a challenge because <laughs> I had to go, I didn't know, but there's a, in LA, there's a, there's an association called the Giant Screen Association, which actually look after IMAX and all those kind of things. And I, I just didn't know where to go because they wanted to shoot in one shot these people dancing for an art gallery. Uh, and have the horizon still stay dead flat on a on a, and I'm saying, well, what lens do I use? What how do I do this? And I went to their technical committee, and they basically come back saying, give this a try. <laughs> so we ended up with some Ari Supreme, some Supreme Primes, a whole series of them, and ended up on the 12 mil, which gave us the the horizon. But um, nobody could give us that answer. And and the other thing we learnt on that, and I think I can say this here is that the Blackmagic 12K is not really 12K. Uh, it has a bayering issue on the sensor. Uh, so in the end, uh, we've now gone back to uh, stitching two 6K um, Venice 2s uh, rather than trying to do it all in one shot. Well, 
Well, that to me, that sounds awesome. Like just every time you're in those position after, especially after a long career, like you've had where you've seen a lot of things, but you're still now pushing the envelopes of what is, is capable. I think that's amazing. Like I, I, that's, those are the type of things that I think I live for. Like, it, it mu- is that the same for you or do you just go like, ah, oh, here's another headache? <laughs> uh, yes, both. <laughs> yeah. I think you got to be a little bit scared. You know, it's it's a bit like uh, any performer. If they're not scared before they get on stage, then you know what are you doing it for? Um, it's it's a, it's a bit like that. You do have to push the envelope, it gets the edge a bit. Um, it is much scarier when when you're doing it by yourself and you don't have a department around you or a, or a facility to blame or somebody. <laughs> you know, it's all your fault. Um, but um, ask. That's the thing, isn't it? It's ask. Don't be, you know, I don't care how good anyone is or how many Academy Awards they've got or whatever. You need to be humble enough, get, getting back to Russell Boyd again, to ask and and to um, share your knowledge uh, and to, you know, keep it a community. And, and uh, instead of everyone being your, um, your competitor, it should never be like that. You know, I cheer people on all the time, uh, everybody I, I work with. Well, I, I think it's a, you know, it's a testament that you are here with us. Like we're, we're this, you know, small little festival that I, and I still don't know to today how you find us, but you entered your film a few years ago into our festival. Um, I think this is, I don't know, is, is this your third year, I think, entering? And I is, think so. Yeah. Yep, yep. And, and, and so f- from, from that to also joining us and be able to share some of your information with the people watching. I think that's just an, a testament to your willingness to do that. So that's great. We really, really appreciate that. Um, well, thank any- you. Thank you. I, I think, you know, AZ Drone Fest has definitely the um, potential to be one of the really big ones. And um, it's, it's you know, I can just tell that you guys really care and you've got community backup and you've got uh, institutional backup and it, you know, and also, you know, on the US Drone Fest level, uh, you know, you're heading national. Uh, so I think, honestly, we, it's all about attitude and you guys have got it and the aptitude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that does help to have to know what you're doing a little bit. But yeah. And, and again, like, you know, for us, we've been really surprised at, at the level of films that we receive every year. It, it keeps going up and up and it's really fun to watch. And and um, for me, it's been really cool to be inspired by some of your shots and, and some of the story you told. I think I think you have two films this year in the festival. Both of them are outstanding. I think you have one in the narrative, which is the the, the Firehawks. And then I think you have one in landscape um, and and just outstanding. So thank you so much for sharing those films with us. And we'll, we'll it's look news to me, to Chris. I didn't, I didn't even know they were in yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I shouldn't say that either because they, I, I, officially they're not. They're, you submitted them no. to the festival. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I'm, I'm not a judge, so I get to enjoy watching <laughs> them. <That's> about it. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that, Chris. No, thanks very much, Chip. Is there a, a place or is there something, uh, a project that you're working on or, or or a website that you want people to go to to learn more about who you are and, and kind of what you do? Um, there's a new project that's come in the door. I just I, There's a guy called Jan Artus Bertron who uh, did a book called, uh, ooh, I'm getting in trouble here, uh, From <laughs> Above. I think he sold six million books, a French um, cinematographer uh, and photographer. Um, And anyway, he's contacted me about um, submitting for his new film, which I think will take a couple of years. Uh, And I I think he's intending to to cover about 60 countries. So um, I'm I'm really honoured to be uh, asked to be involved in that. And uh, but if anyone wants to see uh, some more of my material, uh, it would be just to search Vimeo and then Chris Tangy, T-A-N-G-E-Y. And um, that will probably come up with a selection. If not, I'll go back and work on it right now. <laughs> It'll happen. <laughs> and we'll we'll put the link there. But I'm pretty sure you're right. Your video you know, is just yeah. crazy. So we'll double check yeah. that. Well, listen. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your time. And uh, hopefully one day we can uh, we can come down and enjoy Australia. I've never been, and we would love to meet up for sure. Thanks very much, Chris. Thank you very much. 
Thank you for listening to U.S. Dronecast. For more information about upcoming episodes and to learn more about our upcoming Drone Film Festival, subscribe now and follow us on social or visit us online at usdronecast.com.